If you're a residential real estate agent earning $200,000 a year and you want to grow your passive income, this show's for you. Learn the secrets other agents use and hear from experts in our field in order to guide you along your journey to investing in assets like apartment communities so that you can turn your commissions into cash flow. I'm Randall DeCleared. Let's go, baby. All right, welcome back. We are continuing the series on service providers in the real estate space. Uh, the last few episodes we've had have been away from the the top producing agents. We're going to get back to that, but we've brought on a number of uh, service providers. And today we're bringing on Corey Maxwell. He's an insurance provider with Birmingham Insurance Group. They are branching out and not just in Birmingham. So they're in the middle of a rebrand, but they're doing nationwide insurance for real estate investors specifically. That's where their, their niche is and what they highly focus on. So Corey and I, you're going to hear how he, I guess, got started and how they eventually got into the insurance business and how you as a broker or as an investor can maybe tap into uh, an ability to add revenue to your real estate business by partnering with somebody like them in order to sell your own insurance or use them as a referral base to get insurance. So listen through to the end. That's, that's, a, it's a, Money, it's found money, I think is how we describe it in the show, uh, because it's it's there, you're doing the business anyway, you're either insuring with somebody else or you uh, are having a bunch of clients that are you're doing business with that should be referral money that you could get. So take those tips. Corey's a great guy. We we discuss a lot of things right at the end where uh, we get into some more philosophical stuff. So uh, uh, that's an interesting conversation. And as always, if you're getting value out of the show, please go on wherever you listen to, to, to podcasts, rate the show, tell us how we're doing, write a review. And by all means, we, we look at all of those. I'm happy to, to chat with you. If you have any questions, reach out to me. Uh, you can reach me at rm at ridgelineig.com. Happy to answer any questions and chat with you and just get to know you a little bit better there. So without further ado, let's get into the show. Let's go. So I saw your logo and I was like, big insurance. That's, that is, it's awesome. Yeah. 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 And we're, we're actually, uh, we have two brands that we own and um, so we're consolidating into one and we're kind of trying to figure out what, what that's going to be because mm -hmm. Birmingham insurance group is pretty regional. And then we, our other one is REI choice, which we bought. And, and then, uh, so we're, we're thinking about something that's more, I don't know. It's just more memorable, perhaps. I don't know. Different for sure. But anyway, right now we're just DBAing big yeah. insurance because it's kind of catchy. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things. Go uh, big or go home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like, give me the evolution. Like, how did you guys get started? Like, what's the, what's the story? Because yeah. it, it sounds similar. Like I had a company called SA House Buyers, San Antonio House Buyers. I was like, can't really scale that uh, outside of San Antonio. You can, but <laughs> When you yep. say it in San Antonio, you're like SA house buyers. It kind of sounds like a almost. I'm trying to be, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so I'm just kind of yeah. curious how you guys evolved and and where you started. Yeah. So uh, short story is in um, 2018, early 2018. I was approached about an opportunity to to. Uh, help a gentleman open an insurance agency he had always wanted to and didn't have the uh, didn't have the time or energy or capacity to do it on his own and so the uh the mutual friend who introduced us mentioned the name and then i said oh okay yeah i've known ralph for 20 years we just never talked business mm -hmm. so anyway that's uh that was the beginning of the conversation that led to that led to our June 2018 launch of Birmingham Insurance Group as a, you know, as an official agency business. It was going to be, you know, your typical run of the mills, uh, Main Street type generalist agency. Uh, we, we had some unique opportunities to capitalize on within a group of companies that he owned. And so um, anyway, had a, had a couple of buddies who were looking for some new opportunities. I had a job at the time and didn't, you know, wasn't really prepared to, to leave what I was doing. And so we launched, uh, I was the silent partner, kind of the consulting partner, and then two other guys, June of 2018. So 
we stumbled or we recognized, we didn't stumble on it. We recognized an opportunity in the, uh, you know, the SFR space because the guy that I'd started the business with owned, you know, three or 400 properties of his own. He has a proper, had a property management company. And so as we began to handle those internal requests and needs, we began to, uh, network outside of that, get some introductions, catch some traction and realize, wait a minute, you know, nobody's doing what we're doing. Certainly not effectively in there. <laughs> and if they are, they're, they're not well known at all. You know, they have no presence on the internet. So we, uh, we made an, a, a decision to, to sell our book of business outside of that specialty, that micro niche of serving single family residential investors. Okay. And so that was, uh, that was, that was, I guess, fall of 2019, August, September of 2019, we went all in. And since then, we've been focused exclusively in the area of serving investors and property managers. You know, we have several semi-exclusive programs. We've continued to grow. Frankly, our, you know, our greatest asset are our clients and our relationships. So word of mouth and referral has been uh, how we've grown the business. You know, but what makes us unique is that we have a we have a product that's unique uh, in that the technology is there and no other technology matches it yet in the industry, um, which allows us to offer our programs through the web. OK, on a virtual agency platform. And uh, we were going through COVID and uh, one of the three of our we bought out the original partner and then we had another partner who went off the rails and we bought him out. And so Jason Henderson and I currently own and operate big insurance. And so, so anyway, we went through COVID and it, it kind of revealed some weaknesses in our business model because what he, what we initially had planned to do was actually have a, a white gloved, you know, concierge approach to serving this, this marketplace. But what we found is that our staff was getting in the way and duplicating effort rather than creating efficiency. Uh, and then so we we decided to, uh, you know, move away from a staff based agency and then begin began at that point, you know, somewhere around October of 2020 to really focus on, you know, utilizing the technology that we had available for us at the time and continue to. And so it created some unique challenges. OK, how do we get the word out? Because the biggest the, the most frequently asked question that we had was, well, why haven't I already heard of this? And my answer was exactly, you know, that's the proverbial cat we're trying to skin here. And so anyway, we just, we did our business planning and found that, hey, we're going to focus on relationships, strategic partnerships, customer referrals and recommendations, you know, and, and word of mouth. And so, you know, we've, we've enhanced our presence on social media and really strengthened the engagement there and uh yeah so we um you know we continue to grow i I don't i don't even know the current numbers of total insured values but we have um a little over 1500 customers in you know 37 38 states uh it's a 50 state program so we're available to do business anywhere in the united states and um so off we go. I mean, we, we yeah. you know, it continues to evolve and uh, we've gotten into some commercial real estate, into some multifamily uh, as accommodation in the beginning. And then we, we found that um, we actually have a strong referral presence in both of those areas. So we, we're staying in our lane, but we've, we've de- we're developing some additional verticals. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, in that vertical, we are also wanting to control as much of that as we can. Uh, we're also investors, you know, Randall. So we're fighting the good fight every day. And you know that fight. I mean, yeah. if you aren't an investor, you really can't speak the language. If you don't know what's going on day to day, if you if you aren't experiencing the tenant problems, the contractor problems, the certificate of occupancy and how long that always seems to take. Right. So anyway, those are the things that that make us unique in our space for sure. Yeah. Let's let's unpack that. Because there's a lot of stuff going on in there uh, in, yeah. in history and what you guys are coming from. But in general, right? So you guys are 
an insurance company. One, I'm kind of curious how that process is to set one up. I don't want to dive too deep into it, but like, do you sure. just have to be well capitalized? Do you have to have certain s- structure for the business? Like, what is the process of getting an insurance company up and running and getting licensed in all 50 states? You know, is it because I know TDI? Uh, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. You can answer that because I don't, I don't yeah, know. So know. let's start with what does it take to. Uh, so t- let me start with this actually to clarify because there's a delineation between the insurance company and then the insurance brokers or agents. All right. And at, the, at this point in time, we are technically an agent or a broker who represents okay. these insurance programs. We are not the insurance company Got it. yet. And then, so we have partnerships with several have proven to be solid markets for us, each serving a different niche within this space. So we're not duplicating our efforts. We're not trying to satisfy and you know, feed multiple families, if you will, uh, in, off the same loaf of bread. But um, to answer your question about what does it take, you can you can shoestring it, uh, but but you do need to have some capital primarily to offset the need for for uh, living expenses, right? Because regardless of whether the business is turning any money out and any any net profit out, we still have to meet our meet our obligations every month. So yeah, I would I would say well capitalized and what does well equal? It just depends on the situation. This is my fifth, no, sixth insurance business to start from scratch. And uh, and so what I've learned is you've got to have the long view in mind and make decisions based on that long view, that long play, which is five years is what I, uh, when I speak to others who are looking at getting into insurance, I tell them, look, you better plan to make no money in years one and two, reinvest the money that you make in the company in advertising and development of processes and systems that will allow you to scale, you know, because if you're not scalable, you're going to be stuck in a chair as a technician working on their own rather than you see the, the employee status. Well, I can do it better, cheaper, blah, blah, blah. And then I can keep the money that I make over and above what I'm being paid, right? That's the uh, E myth revisited, E-myth over, revisited. And over, and over again, right? Michael Gerber, right? And, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, so um, you need to have relationships. Okay. You need to have relationships with insurance companies because you have to be contracted with those companies. And uh, starting from scratch, you have nothing to offer them other than your promise, your commitment, your yeah. ability to deliver. Yeah. And then, um, you know, there are, of course, overhead, uh, you need to decide which, you know, which path you're going to take and those kinds of things. So that's the, that's the gist of it. You know, money, uh, commitment, you need to have perspective, meaning that five-year view. And if you don't have those things and the relationships, if you don't have those things, you got to find them. Yeah. And it sounds like the the book of business, the way you guys structured it, the way you started, you had somebody who had a a large book of business they could just basically bring into the deal. What piqued my interest in the way you said that was you started it, you guys were running that business, and then he essentially packaged that or you guys packaged that book of business and sold it. And and so then the general book. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's an interesting way to set it up. So he made money on his book of business, self-insured, essentially. We're proud to be sponsored by Ridgeline Investment Group. Ridgeline has a track record of transacting more than 53 million in assets throughout Texas. Ridgeline is currently looking to acquire 100 to 200 unit class B multifamily communities between five and 20 million in San Antonio, Temple, Waco, Tyler, and other Texas secondary markets. To learn more about Ridgeline Investment Group, visit www.ridgelineig.com. Let's kind of take it take it back and, and again, talk about big insurance, right? So you guys are Birmingham um, Insurance Group. Um, you said you had two different brands. You guys are looking to expand that that brand to, what was it called? REI, RE, what was it? REI Choice. REI Choice, which okay. Was a, it was a friendly competitor and you know, yeah. we were, uh, we, we just were introduced by a mutual friend and it worked out where we could acquire that, that book of business, uh, yeah. that brand. And you know, in other words, it was an asset purchase 
Yeah. And so do, uh, we rolled it in. How do you guys compare to like an NREG? Cause I've used them N R E I G. I think something like that. I've used them. And I, and what I love about it is it's super simple. It's online. I just go in, I plug a property address in and they give me a quote or something. There are yep. some things that are finicky that I don't love about it. Right. Um, right. But when, when you're doing a volume business and you're out there just flipping a ton of properties, it's, it's easy in, easy out, you're replacing something. So again, I want to talk about, you, you mentioned something like, Hey, we have this technology. Okay. What is the technology? You know, you didn't tell, tell me what that is. What is the tech that makes uh, your insurance program better or f- easier to use? I don't know. Yeah. So it's, I would say it's a little bit of both, better and easier to use. Okay. I'm quite familiar with the NREIG program as uh, we are actually a retail representative of that program. Okay. What does that and mean? We can sell their products. Got it. Okay. Directly. So so we're contracted with them. It's yeah. like the other ones that we're, you know, contracted with. And so so with with our particular program, if you put it side by side with the NREIG, all right. NREIG's program is a good one. Uh, their software is fairly easy to use. You, you know, every software program is going to have its quirks. Um, what makes ours unique is that the program can issue new business similarly, okay, through a portal based uh, access point that each investor would have for themselves it's private and and uh you know in other words we have back-end access to support the needs of our clients but they're the only ones from the front end that can access their portal right sure. or whomever they grant access to yep. and and so it does allow you to go in and within 30 seconds 45 seconds tops you'll have a quote that's not only a quote but it is a bindable number uh, that if you like it, want to move forward, you click bind and you pay for it. And then you're able to email certificates right out. You're able to make the payments there. You can set it up on auto pay. You can pay in full or manually. So, uh, or um, escrow, of course, uh, escrow pay uh, at closing or, or going forward. So, you know, it's a, our model is, is more along the self-service line so that you have access 24 seven, you have full control over your insurance program and you don't need us to conduct your day-to-day business as an investor or as a property manager. Okay? Yeah, it's super you helpful. Can, you can, it is, it yeah. is. And, you know, we were, again, with the, with the, in the beginning, we were wanting to set ourselves apart by being a concierge type representative. But at the end of the day, the vast majority of, of investors are, you know, mom and pop shops, you know, 10 and under, you, it's not your full-time gig. It's and, and insurance is a is a sort of a necessary evil, of course, until you need it, right? And then you that hey, I made a great decision, or hmm, maybe I could have chosen more wisely. But making our program available is to to more and more investors out there is is our is our path currently. Yeah. Okay. But staying on the topic of that of that software. The program's been around for years. It began as a force placed or REO insurance program. And so by the nature of that need, it had to be streamlined. It had to be simple. It had to be fast and it had to be reliable. All right. And so that 30 years of data and, you know, just program development has now taken an accelerated path toward, you know, just just constantly improving on what's already working pretty well. So that's kind of the the gist of it. This the simplicity, the speed, the access. Those are the three things that set it apart. The program in particular, what makes it unique is there are very few questions. There are no inspections, there are no pictures required. We don't care about your loss history or any of that. You plug in an address, the software generates a uh a replacement cost estimate. So in other words, most people have no idea, you know, what is it going to cost to replace this house if it were to burn to the ground? You know, they're looking at either what they have in the house uh, from the purchase price, the ARV, which is probably the closest, but not necessarily. Then you have market value, right? But none of those matter. It's all about what does it cost me to put this property back as it were if, if I have a, you know, a total loss. 
And so then you um, you choose your number of insurance, you input your annual rental uh, income figures and uh, make one other choice and you're good to go. So it literally takes like 30 seconds. Yeah. I mean, have you done it a time or two? It's done. Yeah. Have you seen any anyone like making uh, making huge mistakes in that in that they are either underinsuring or overinsuring their properties and wasting. Here they are right here. You see this hand up? Yeah. Yeah. We've already made them all. You can't break this thing. No, I mean, I mean, so, so I've been in there and I've, and and, and it asks you like, how do you want to insure this property? And then you can, you can definitely uh, mess it up. Maybe, maybe talk about the uh, difference in replacement cost value and the actual cost value and how those two insurances uh, differ and, because again, on on the rehab side, you're always you're always getting a certain type of insurance, right? And builder's risk and all that stuff. I'm sure you guys are including in that. So maybe speak to that for those who don't okay. understand what those things are. Yeah. So so our program has two options, but we only endorse the replacement cost value. So there there are two options, generally speaking, when it comes to placing a va- an insurance value on an investment property. Okay. And and so. And we're going to use insurance terminology here. So the one is replacement cost, which means that uh, we will pay to replace the prop, the damaged property up to the limit of insurance as it relates to replacing the property. All right. Most insurance is going to have what's called a co-insurance clause, which says that if I don't insure the property to value or within 20% of the actual replacement cost at the time that I buy the insurance, then I could be penalized in the event of a partial claim, kitchen fire, you know, um, toilet backs up, pipe burst. Okay. These aren't going to destroy the whole house most of the time, but they're going to cause significant damage. And so as an investor and knowing that flips and other things, you know, when you buy the property and you put money into it or whatever, you're going to end up selling it in that flip situation. And so you may want to invest in, I mean, you may want to insure it at the value of money that you have in that property, right? So for example, if I buy a house at a hundred thousand and I spend 25,000 or yeah, let's just call it 25,000 fixing it up. So I have 125 in it, but the ARV might be 175, right? So we think, okay, well, I only have 125 in it. So why am I worried about it? I'm going to sell it anyway. I'm, I'm flipping it. Well, because our program includes, yes, the builder's risk component, which includes the materials and labor as it relates to the you know construction in progress, right? Once it's habitable again, then builder's risk is no longer applicable. But let's just say that you bought the house in a, in a, in a part of town that's a de- has depressed values. Okay. So even though the ARV might be $175, I mean, $175,000, you know, the replacement cost might be substantially more than that, right? Because construction cost, labor cost, those kinds of things, uh, if it's a 2,000 square foot house, I mean, used to, we used to see $125 a square foot would build a house back, right? Now, it's going to be, and I'm just speaking specifically to the Birmingham market. Okay, yeah. um, we're talking about builders' grade materials, that kind of thing. Uh, now it's upwards of 175, and the delay uh, construction time, right? So it's taking longer to get these things rehabbed, and so therefore, the cost of construction is substantially higher than in quote unquote normal, you know, times in the marketplace, and so, uh, so. Having a property insured to value prevents any potential shortfall in a claim situation. Okay. And it also makes sure that what you intend on your insurance program to deliver at the time of a loss is, is delivered. Okay. So what you're investing in is a guarantee, the promise from an insurance company to do what they say they're going to do. Right. And so since this is a unilateral contract, Hey, I'm, Here's what I want to have happen. I'm paying my premiums. It's on the insurance company to deliver at the time of a loss. All right. So, so to 
to address the flip side, the ACV, which is actual cash value. Yeah, that's okay. what I meant. Yeah. Thanks. That, that, sure. Uh, that version is simply cost new minus depreciation equals ACV. Okay. So, of course, as we know, different components in a construction project, if you will, are going to have different uh, rates of accelerated or not depreciation. You know, some are 27 years and then some can be accelerated, especially if you if you've got a, a, a higher value home uh, that you actually do a cost segregation analysis. So uh, and that's another topic that we can get into later. But so ACV is going to get you kind of like what you have in it. All right. Then replacement cost is going to allow you to reconstruct that property as close to pre-loss condition as you can and then allow you to continue that asset uh, to build equity, to continue to have cash flow from that asset, and then obviously can uh, have the opportunity to sell it at a later date at a profit, right? Yeah. So we all know that there are multiple cash flow or cash or accumulation, you know, wealth building benefits to investment property. And that's why we chose the replacement cost route. So you know, we begin with the end in mind. Yeah, sure. So let me let me ask you then on that scenario you gave you're in it for 125 property you can sell for 175, but mm-hmm. you're in a depressed market. You think that um, to get it back to that status at 175 a foot, not to be confused with 175 ARV, then you really need 225 in coverage. Just say, yeah. So so or within 20 percent of that. Okay. So why 20 okay, percent? So you got to because you. There are different. Um, so coinsurance is the is the clause in certain insurance policies that protect the insurance company from the masses of mistakes that have been made in recent past where, you know, catastrophic events happened and and large numbers of insurance policy of 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 home structures were underinsured. Yet their replacement cost said we got to build it back. Right. And so insurance companies have been hammered by that technicality. And they're just not going to do it anymore. So there is a there is a clause in in a lot of contracts these days that will protect the insurance company from that um, unnecessary or, or unknown or unrealized exposure. Right. In other words, insurance works by charging a fair price per dollar of coverage. All right, because all you're doing is swapping sure. dollars for dollars. You know, I'm I'm swapping risk for premium. All right. And so, uh, yeah, so so that's why I say that you want to you want to be aware. And what's important to have is a is a relationship with an agent or, or a broker like us that, yeah, we've we've got unfettered access to the program. You can self-manage it all you want, but lots of things happen. Hey, I'm having I've got this billing question. Hey, I've got this technology, you know, this this. How do I do this? How do I do that? You know, or especially what happens at claim time, because nobody knows unless you've already been through that scenario before. Right. And not many people have been through a loss or a claim scenario with a home. Fortunately, it doesn't happen a lot. Right. And so uh, so we are there to fall back on you reach out to us and you're talking to one of the owners. Okay, so what we do is we respond as if we were in your shoes. I mean, we make, you know, two promises. Number one, you know, we're going to shoot you straight. Number two, we're going to do the right thing. And those are our two main commitments. We're going to have fun in our business and we're only going to do business with people that we know, like, and trust. Yeah. So that, that just lends to a better relation, business relation, well, any relationship, but but in particular here, the better business relationship there. And it also allows us to uh, or challenges us to continue to bring value and earn your business every day. You sure. Know? So um, I guess let's keep it on the on the on the insurance. If again, as a consumer, when yeah. I hear, yeah, you should do this higher, higher, like you should insure up to 225 in the scenario that we just mm-hmm. gave to me, sure. I'm like, well, you just want me to do that because my premium is going to go up. Right. You want more premium. So like, again, how how do you strike? How do you find that? that proper amount to ensure assuming that claims are one in 
I don't know how I don't know yeah, if yeah, yeah, yeah. right. You know, it's yeah. like so yeah, sure so you're, you're trading rolling. risk, yeah. but on the insurance side, sure. you guys you guys are obviously skewing it to the you need to make a profit, right? You're not just doing it out of the goodness of your heart. It's so yeah, right. It's like right. again, that's the that's the consumer mindset in my it, so the, yeah. So the question yeah. as a consumer is why shouldn't I view that as an upsell? Sure. hundred percent. So, and, and look, I'm buying this stuff too, right? Yeah. I mean, we insure our own properties. Okay. Yeah. And, and so we have to answer the same cash flow questions that everybody else does. Yeah. Okay. And so the answer is we don't care what you insure it for, because that's a, all we want to do is give you the tools to make an educated decision that fits your scenario the best. All right. So you can choose to insure it for less than that. It's not a forced number. Sure. Okay. It's a it's a provided number that gives you a starting point because very few people have any idea what the replacement cost is on a structure. Yeah. Now there are just too many variables and with the ability to to invest from afar, you know, long distance investing and remote investing and things like that, you know, strategic part. So so we offer that as a guideline. All right. And it's a new a new component and quite frankly we've had a number of people uh that we are aware of having had the conversation of hey i had no idea that i was underinsured this much let's move it up i'm like okay great you know that's not our choice that is not that has nothing to do with us influencing that decision because look we have houses i mean we've got like 14 flips going on right now you know and so, I mean, we're choosing to maximize our cash flow, and therefore we're willing to accept a little bit more risk on the catastrophic claim side uh, because we can just take that money and go get another house. I mean, yeah. We're not going to build that house back. You know, it's just that's we're not doing ground up construction right now. And so my point earlier, which was. Our recommendation is always to begin with the end in mind. So if the end in mind is I want to build this house right right back, I mean, right where it is, just like it was or as closely to that as I can, because this is a great appreciation market. There, there, there's strong rents here. You know, there's low uh, inventory, you know, all those things. Yeah. Right. But in our situation, the flips and the properties is, is so underserved in the area that we're investing that we're just going to take the money and keep moving. And so it's a, it's a matter of making it's a, it's a matter for us as risk advisors to provide information that allows you to make an educated decision that best suits your needs. I mean, if the cash flow model is such where you've got to pinch the pennies, then pinch them, but just know that if the total loss happens, you're only going to get a reduced yeah. amount that you agreed to on the front end as your, you know, as your claim yeah. settlement. You get your pennies so, back. Pens that's right. Pennies, get your pennies, pennies in, back. pennies out. Yeah, that's right. Go. So l- let's take it back again. The, the The purpose of the show is we're talking to agents. We're talking to people that, that want to build some cash flow. So assume that let's take it from the brokerage side and then we'll talk investments. So on the brokerage side, if I am setting up a brokerage and I, I literally saying I want to incorporate insurance or insurance sales as part of my brokerage to get additional income coming in what's the best path that somebody could take to to doing something like that in my opinion uh it's going to be to partner with someone who has done it before and who has been successful in launching an agency or a brokerage platform who has arrangements or access to you know, helping find access to capital, helping find access to the markets. Mm-hmm. The relationships are there. And in in our niche market space of single family residential investing uh, investment insurance, they the, the carriers just aren't handing out contracts. So we have begun to wholesale our uh, programs and we have four or five um, wholesale, arra- wholesale arrangements right now. And then we've, we're starting, uh, we have three more in process. And so if an agent were interested in ex- accessing our program, then we would be able to wholesale that out. We'd be able to provide that agent with their own high level platform. Okay. Their, yeah. their own. You mean like white label, um, uh, white label sort of deal. Okay. Yep, that's exactly right. 
So, but, but you're, you're geared more toward the investor side still. So again, if, if it's a, um, so it it, it wouldn't be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This platform wouldn't be good necessarily for a a broker, a high volume broker, who's got a lot of clients. And he says, look, you know, if you sign up with your insurance, you're going to get a a discount because, you know, we have line of sight on this sort of thing and they can immediately grow that side. It also depends on, are you wanting to, to be a general agency? Do you want to focus on personal lines insurance? Do you want to focus on commercial lines insurance? Do you want to do a mix of both? Speaking specifically as if I'm a broker, real estate broker, tr- and I and I do- Oh, real estate I, broker. Yeah. Got it. And I do a hundred plus transactions a year through my brokerage. Yeah. So and I, I would every single one of my I, agents- I wouldn't start an agency. Okay. But I know I would guys that, that do it. Okay. So yeah. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. You asked me my opinion. My opinion is I wouldn't start an agency. I'd partner with someone in a strategic arrangement yep. because then you don't have to go get licensed. You don't have to run an agency. You don't have to manage two businesses. Yep. You don't have to do any of that. You, you're able to receive a net income that's potentially higher than you would if you started the agency and ran it your own entity. Yeah. Had all your okay. own your cost of goods and all but of that. Yeah. That's exactly right. Now, we have clients that are still interested in, in doing that, but we haven't had one single client actually move forward in that, in that regard. I mean, yeah. when you dig into it and you, and you, and you really look under the hood and see what's going on and what it requires, there's a lot more to it than just meets the eye. Uh, you have to sell it. You have to service it. You have to insure it, <laughs> you know, so you're buying more insurance uh, to protect yourself against errors and emissions or, you know, professional liability exposures. You're likely having to manage additional staff. Um, at, but at minimum, you're going to take your focus away from your staff currently that's involved 100% in your real estate transactions and divert their attention to learning a new system, learning a new product, being able to service the account, speak the lingo. I mean, you got to get licensed. Uh, there's there's just a lot of um, commitment there. Again, there's a lot of commitment and 100 transactions a year is only going to generate you maybe $10,000 of revenue. A year? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So insurance is not a get rich quick scheme. No, it's a book it's of a business. Build. I get that. Yeah. You're, you're, it's but a build and build and build. That, That's right. Here, here's the deal, Mike. On on the number of transactions that that we have done, had I set up insurance or something like this a long time ago, and I just built a book of business, one, it's a sellable book of business. And that's the Absolutely. when you're flipping a house, you're you're in and out, wham bam, thank you, ma'am, you're done. You move on to the next deal. You're not making any more money from a flip. Um, unless you want to finance or unless you do some sort of creative thing on the back end where you're renting it out or keeping it, holding that asset. And so Again, anything that that we're all in business. So I'm just kind of curious. Again, you, you could build okay. that up. I could have I could have a book of business, and that's that's sellable at the end of the day. That that we could do. Some agents do more, but at the end of the day, if I were uh, if I were setting this up, and I came to you and I said, "Hey, look, I have this retail side. We want to actually be able to just promote it and just say, hey, boom.' And I and I want to get a kickback from you. We disclose everything to the clients. Like, yep. What does that look like? Uh, it's real simple. It's a one-page application. It's a three-page agreement, just a standard standard agreement that says what part party A is going to provide. This is what party B is going to provide, and and for that, there's going to be a, a revenue generated of that revenue. We're going to share it at this percentage. And what is then, typical? What's typical on a rev share agreement like that? So usually seventy thirty. Okay. So thirty percent going to the referring party, okay, and seventy seventy percent retained uh, here at Big. Okay, so that, that um, again, that, that could be goal. a way to just increase a bit of revenue. Absolutely, and and, and, yeah. and it's um, and our programs have a have an extremely high closing rate. I mean, we're up in the eighties on the uh, closing rate from what we provide proposals on or what we quote versus what we becomes a client. Uh, yeah. And so it's um, it's a relatively it's certainly a simple process. We just turn it into a referral process. I mean, we've got APIs we can plug and play in the back of a 
you know, in the back of a, an existing website. Again, it's seamless. And, and, and that way you're creating that revenue stream that is consistent. It's saleable in the end, but more importantly, it's building, it's building on itself. And yeah, you don't have to go start over every day, which is yeah. what you have to do with, you know, with most real estate transactions other than the buy and hold. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's an interesting point. Anybody that is thinking or, or pondering that sort of, that sort of deal that is, um, again, on the title insurance side, that's one avenue. And and I talked to another agent about that a while back and, and you can go back and listen to that episode. It was AJ Patterson, I believe he started his. And, and so that's always been an interesting thing. And then, um, on the actual property insurance, the thing is, is it still like for you guys, are you geared more toward the investment sales and the investment side? So it's maybe a broker that has a lot of investor base that are going out flipping properties and they're listing them for them. That would probably be the best fit, mm-hmm. it sounds like. Great. Yeah. So that sort of thing. So let, let's jump into the investor side, right? We've got, like I said, I've flipped a bunch of houses. I've been in the the, in the investing side more so than the brokerage side. I've been a broker for, for a lot of years, but always focus on the investment. So insurance has always been a thing. I wonder still if I would have, you know, like set up my own side where I, where I could, you know, get a kickback on my own policies that I was creating. <laughs> it's like, should have, oh, yes. should have been doing that for a long time. Well, so let's, well, yeah. I mean, right now, that's just an example of found money, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the money's slipping through your fingers every day. So as many of those holes, you know, as many yeah. of those holes as we can plug, yeah. Uh, right, the better off we're going to be. So, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely, would have been better to do that from uh, ground zero. But yeah, I'm learning every day. No so. better day to start than today. <laughs> <It's> like, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so, so I, I've made a shift into the large multifamily space. You know, fifty to two hundred unit uh, apartments, and so I have noticed that the insurance rates have gone up dramatically in the last year or two. And so yes. what is happening there? Why? Can you explain to listeners what's going on there? Adverse selection is what's causing it. We're the largest uh, populations. If you think about it, it's it's Florida, California, Texas, of course, up in the Northeast, but you know, the, uh, New York, New Jersey, they're all. So you're dealing with the likelihood, the higher likelihood of catastrophic events happening with whether it be fires out west, hurricanes, tornadoes, everywhere else, yeah. okay, earthquakes, and again, earthquakes out west, not so much, sure. um, you know, out east here, but but yeah, so that but that's where the population is because those are desirable areas to live for one reason or another, you know, multiple reasons, and so w- when you have a series of of years where catastrophic events occur multiple times in the same year, boom, boom, boom. Then the loss ratios, which are the insurance premiums are designed to to fund the operational component of the insurance program. And then they're also designed to place reserves or to buy reinsurance uh, to offset any potential claims. Right. And so when when the ratios get out of whack or go over 100 percent, then you're in the red from an underwriting profit perspective. And there's nothing that can be done except for change your underwriting appetite and or, or your pricing. Those are the only two things. So in other words, I'm going to make it hard. I, the insurance company says, we're going to make it harder for you to qualify or we're not going to write insurance in Florida, Texas, California, Louisiana. I mean, it's we're dealing with all this right now. And so what further impacts that is that reinsurance carriers like Lloyd's of London, who are behind the majority of these specialty lines of insurance programs, they're going, hey, we're we're bleeding like a stuck pig here. We're out. Go find somebody else. All right. And so we've been fortunate enough to align with some folks who are creating underwriting profit. Uh, and are instead of having carriers pull out of areas, we're actually gaining capacity in areas, and we're still full speed in all fifty. Yeah, what's There's the what's the limitation. difference? Then why are they why are they wanting to go into those areas? Is it we're recapitalizing and we're gaining back the prior profits we lost because we are charging more? 
like higher in premiums. So they're, we're paying they're, for the past. They're a little bit. They're a little bit. Yeah, it's sort of like we got to stop the bleeding first. So we're not yeah. going to write any more business in those areas where we've been shot up, <laughs> shot holes into our programs. And in some cases, they are completely pulling out of those programs. And then program administrators are having to find other carriers. So we're diversified. We our guys have relationships at that high level, and have known that this is coming. And, and are keenly aware. I mean, they're running risk models daily to, uh, to to make sure that we don't run into a capacity issue. And then further, you know, it's it's spread among or uh, yeah, spread among several reinsurance carriers rather than going all in with one. Okay, so it softens that risk as well in the way of losing capacity. And you know, like in Florida. I mean, we're one of the few companies that are writing investor insurance in Florida at all. You mentioned multifamily. There are, you know, there are few and few, uh, fewer and fewer carriers that are interested in writing insurance on multifamily at all. And if they do, and, and I mean, particularly in these higher risk areas, and if they do, like I'll give you an example, um, a multifamily broker friend of mine. And I have I mean, had these conversations ongoing for the last six or eight months, just seeing it coming. But then he had a deal in Louisiana where the insurance numbers that they plug in per door were seven, eight hundred dollars per door. And then the quotes that they were getting back on this deal were three thousand dollars a door per year for insurance yeah. when the whole deal might have typically been five thousand dollars per door, right? So it really royally skews the uh, the ratios, the financial ratios, and the performas, and ultimately uh, the insurance cost ended up killing that deal for sure, right? Or at least freezing it for now because they were just like, it doesn't work. The numbers yeah. don't work, and men lie, women lie. Numbers never do. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> that's the way it is. That's funny. So, so um, yeah. So, plus, you're seeing this huge ramp up in inventory, right? And and I was just reading an article in Bigger Pockets this morning about, hey, is this going to be a problem for multifamily? Because we're actually going to have ne- you know negative absorption rates in some markets. And so, I mean, if there's <laughs> if if it's over inventory, then there's additional cash flow. Uh, pressure on those properties as well. So, you know, it's not your typical market in anything. Yeah. And then, and then because of the catastrophic claims, insurance, just like most everything else, is sort of cyclical over time. Okay. And so in insurance, we refer to these as soft markets and hard markets. Okay. So in a soft market, the underwriting uh, profits are high and therefore the premiums can be reduced, right? Uh, and still maintain a, a a fair profit margin. But then during a hard market, it's where things like capacity are affecting and then cl- catastrophic claims and negative loss ratios. So that makes the market raise its price and find that insurance is harder to place. So hard market, soft market. Makes sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So those are, it's a combination of things. It's kind of like, it's nearly a perfect storm like we had in 08, but not quite as, it's not the same storm, yeah. right? But it's having some of the same impacts. Look at the banks. I mean, look at the banks that have closed. I mean, that forced closed. And you wonder, well, how, our bank, like our bankers, we're, we're having to look at every deal differently. We're having to re-underwrite the deals that we have on the books because we're like, do we have risk in here that is, inherently higher than we thought. So it's all those factors that go into it. And at the end of the day, you can still find good deals and you can still make it work, right? You just have to be more selective. And so it's it's in fact creating a harder market in the real estate space as well as the insurance space. 100%. Yeah. So a lot of the things on the, on the headwind side of the multifamily space has been very difficult to to find and make deals pencil. The rates went up, interest rates. Uh, we've got sellers who purchase these properties with uh the the floating rates and and when they went up obviously their underwrites went just got shot and so yep. what their ex, their expectation their sales price they still have to hit that number in order to be made whole because of how much That's they right. borrowed 
and yet they can't, right? And so, yeah, I talked to really? another commercial broker yesterday or the day before, and he's talking about being from the retail side, he's seeing more and more deals in, in actual multifamily deals. His mm-hmm. brokerage is getting more and more multifamily mm-hmm. deals from lender foreclosures. Like he's seeing that now. He's like, it's it's a, it's coming. It and so, yeah, the challenge of uh, the rents, you named you named a few things. So you have more inventory coming online from new construction, class A yep. sort of type properties that are coming on. It's going to force the rents either down or stagnate, at least in, in my mind. And then uh, because the oversupply, uh, yeah, I think vacancy or occupancy is going to not it, it suffer a little bit depending on the market to, that you're in because there's going to be maybe an oversupply. I don't know. Everybody still says that that we're undersupplied by so many housing units. But uh, when you have that much hitting and the prices that they're trying to charge for those units, so the rent's got to come down, the vacancy's got to go go up one or the other, right? Or, then you, or potentially both is is yeah. the concern at this point, and and it's not every market, right? It's sure. not every market. Sure, it's it's uh it's your big it's your big metro markets. I mean, we have uh, I can't even tell you how many um, large multifamily projects are going on in Bur- I mean, Birmingham's a million people. You, you know? guys are booming. I get deal across my desk every day about a, a deal in Birmingham. Yeah. And so one of the things that we've done uh, as a value add for our customer base and for, you know, our referral partnerships is is we look for other ways to bring value. And so we actually have a, um, a lender relation, actually multiple lender relationships where you can still, you know, you can still get access to non-recourse funding on multifamily deals. Right. And at a competitive rate. And so. What's That's competitive? Huge. What's competitive uh, right now? Well, what's, well, it's, what's the prevailing rate? <laughs> it depends on the deal, right? Yeah, but um, sure. competitive in the sevens. I mean, I it's saw a not guy like, on a twenty unit. He was quoted uh, eight something just just yeah. a, a week ago. I was like, oof, yeah, man. So or I think it was know, an SBL sort of. Sort well, of and that's what I was going to say is twenty units. You're okay. still not spending a ton of money on. I mean, it's a significant purchase. Don't get me wrong. But you mentioned that you're you're in the five hundred. You know what? What did you say? Fifty, 50 to, to five hundred. Yeah. yeah, fifty to two hundred. Okay. Fifty to two hundred. Okay, sure. so you're getting into more sizable deals. Yeah. All right. So this non recourse money really only it begins at maybe the two to five million dollar level. So if you're not getting into a project of that size, then the underwriters aren't going to pay a whole lot of attention to it. Yeah. Right. And so the key, though, is having someone of influence who can pencil the deal and then go, hey, lender, here's a deal I'd like for you to look at. And he gets funded upwards, you know, 90 something percent of the time. OK. And so it's just having those those a little extra something that adds value to doing business with with our agency and with us. Then again, I mean. It, this there's selfish motive here too, right? I mean, we're, we're chasing the same money. We're we're looking for the same deals. We we're seeking all, all the same answers that everybody else is. We just happen to have more exposure to the deals and the opportunities. And then, so like, yeah, I had a conversation with a, a private money lender last week who was referred to us to solve a need for a client. And then turns out, hey man, I love what y'all are doing. I want to, I want, I want a portal. Yeah. Okay, great. You know, let's do it because it'll help yeah. them close more business. But it gives him control over. Hey, uh, we walked through the deal yesterday, and I was on the phone with the lender who had gotten the buyer, you know, the client on the phone as well. And the lender was looking at his little lender box, but I was looking at things from an investor who also knows insurance, knows the lending conversation and actually that he was going to cut himself out of about forty thousand dollars or so of funding when he didn't need to he was looking at it from you know when, i mean your vision is only as wide as it is right so the more information that we have the more we can expand our vision and it opens our eyes our proverbial eyes to um, more ways to solve problems and that's what ultimately we get paid to do yeah, you know, as uh, investors, how, as did as you save agents. money on this premium or something? How did you actually get no. to? Okay, because obviously that'll affect your debt service and your. And no, your, right. Yeah, but what I spoke 
was truth into the equation. I spoke truth and fact into the equation. All I was doing again was giving information that allowed Chris, the investor, to make a better decision for himself, which he agreed to the higher funding amount, which ultimately benefited the, you know, the lender. But everybody, it, it was agreed upon. It was Chris's decision. Sure. It was Reggie's funding deal. I'm on the outside consulting at this point because he's not a customer of mine yet. Okay. And so that's what we do. We have a, uh, we have a, a consulting component of our business. And, and so we do risk management consulting and yeah. it just comes with it uh, with most of our clients. Yeah. It sounds like uh, if you're listening, you should be looking at insurance and thinking about insurance, especially if you're on the investment side um, in, in a different way and finding a strategic partner who's going to work with you and, and kind of coach you through what you should be doing. One, it could help with your funding, as you just alluded to just there. But obviously, it could save you or 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 repay you if you have the wrong insurance or the right insurance. So, um, I think that's a good spot. Let's let's cap it there. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Just get get to know Corey a little bit better, uh, aside from work. Uh, so, what are uh, what's your favorite pastime not related to business? I love to ride ATVs. Oh, all right. I Did love. That well, I mean, being out being out. Outdoors anywhere is great with me, but one of the things that I'm passionate about is ATVs. And uh, so we, my wife and I, it's something that my wife and I can do together and we uh, can go alone and end up with people out there, you know, meet new friends, make new friends. But ultimately we, we're, we're outside, we're enjoying nature, we're having a good time and, uh, you know, get dirty, but so what? <laughs> yeah, no, that's fun. Wash so off. Do you, do you, are there uh, tracks out there or is it like, how do you, yeah, man, there are, so there are, uh, well, of course you have some areas have public land that's available where you can go and just okay. trails have naturally developed through the years. But what's more popular nowadays are the um, managed trail systems, the private land. I mean, there, there's one in Knoxville, Tennessee, that's, 70,000 contiguous acres, you know, it's 350 miles of trails and you can, I mean, I've been half a dozen times or more and I I could still go ride on virgin trails to my eyes, you know? Yeah. Um, But yeah, so there are, there are places you can, but uh, no, I just normally get a hotel or a cabin. Okay. Okay. I didn't know if it was like you, once you're yeah, so out, what we do is we, you're hauling ass out there and then you, you camp somewhere and then you, Oh yeah, no, no, it's uh it's not, it's, you can do rides like that. They're going to be more out West. I mean, where, you, okay. where you're just driving miles and miles and miles out to the middle of nowhere and maybe making a loop or an out and back or Got whatever. Okay. Now, these are, <clears throat> these, these are sectioned and you can, you can go ride all day and then come back to the truck and, go shower up and then oh, yeah. You know, yeah. have dinner in town or whatever. That's kind of what we like to do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're all manner of, of different ways to enjoy it for sure. Yeah. My, my neighbor has an ATV and he uses it going hunting. I've gone, one of my friends has yeah. a dirt bike ranch here in San Antonio or just South of San Antonio. So we've gone out there and done that. But yeah, that sounds that the one you just described is huge. That is a massive yeah, ranch. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've had my, I've had my time on motorcycles, but I'm, I'm uh, I'm I'm not as uh, <laughs> fleet of foot as I once was. Uh, it's not as he's, he's really good on it, but better. yeah, yeah I, I almost uh, I almost ate it a few times. I was like, yeah, yeah it still hurts to wreck. <laughs> I could use four. <laughs> yeah, that's um, right. So in a cage and a seat belt. That's right. You know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, what's the what's the best thing or memory that's happened to you uh, and your family in the last sixty days? Uh. uh Wow. Uh, the best thing that happened to my family in the last 60 days is, is the, um, I think it's been the opportunity to, to serve my, my parents. They are entering into their later years, not quite in the need of care yet, but you know, it's just recognizing that that season is coming. And then preparing for that and being able to speak to them and with them. I, I went through it vicariously watching them care for their parents. And so it opens up different conversations. I mean, 
deeper levels of communication. And it also um, allows us a chance to give back for, for as many times and as many ways and things as they've given to me, to us. And, and so the cool part is that my wife and I are of the same philosophies as it relates to family. And so uh, there's never any argument about, we need to go do this. Are you in? It has nothing yeah. to do with that anymore. It's just like, hey, we need to go do this tomorrow or whenever. My parents live four hours away, right? So it's not like we can just jump in the car and go over for an afternoon. But but it's just the ability to serve or the opportunity to serve them in a way that they've served us and others before and just kind of be a blessing, you know, in that way. Yeah, that's incredible. All right, well said. I, I when when we had our kids, it was a it was like a complete mind shift in my it was like there's nothing as important as family. And so it just like has been a uh, a growth. And my mom is caretaking my grandma right now. So I'm seeing that vicariously, yeah. just like you just explained. And so, yeah, yeah that's a that's an interesting uh, time and the way you described a season as well of, of their lives. So uh, yeah, wish you all the best with that and, and that Thank process. Um, so name one or two people who have been most influential to the way you think or to your success. Yeah, so my dad is definitely one of those. He's just, over time, really spoken a lot of wisdom and truth and shown a lot of love and, you know, forgiveness. <laughs> As my business partner, Jason, says, he's allowed a lot of grace and space, um, but yet stuck by my side and been my biggest cheerleader. And so... So definitely my dad is one of those. And interestingly, as I get older, that list gets shorter and shorter of who I would include in that company. Right. And, you know, for sure, I would say a tie for first is going to be God and, and, and how he is, uh, how he has uh, developed me into who I am now and continues to work on me to be a better person for for me, for a representative of how he would have me live my life, of my family, and and ultimately it's permeated into my MO, you know, my overall how I approach things and and how I do things. You know, so I would say that's a tie for first and it's in different ways. All right. But but number two uh, is one that I didn't even recognize until he passed away uh, in an auto accident, but it was my high school coach. So I uh, went to a small school, you know, about 550 students. Athletics was a huge thing in our in our school, in our town. The whole town followed the, you know, the team and everything. Not in Alabama. Um, I can't see that. Believe it or not. <laughs> believe it or not. Believe it or not, Mr. Ripley. That's right. But uh, so his, his name's Donnie Roch, and he was my baseball coach and then my offensive line coach in football. And uh, I, I just I had no idea the impact that he was making on me until he passed. And I began to reflect. And, of course, you've got to be old enough, if you will, mature enough, wise enough to be able to look and reflect on those kinds of impactful things that were occurring and you didn't even know it, right? It was just shaping and molding. And I mean, I kind of have long hair now. He wouldn't allow it. It's got to be above the collar. I'm going to kick you off the team. You know, yeah. I wanted to butt heads, but I didn't want to lose my my spot on the squad, right? But um, it's present yourself well all the time. You only have one time to make a first impression. Make it well. Um, you don't have to be dressed up all the time to be presenting yourself well, right? Obviously, I'm not wearing a collared shirt cutting grass or anything, but you get my point, you know, is, is, is present yourself in a way that honors yourself, that honors your family, that honors your God or, you know, whoever you're representing. Um, and, and, you know, and just there, I could go on and on with yeah. the life lessons that I've, I've, I've began, that I've begun to sort of pull out of those key relationships. And my goal in recognizing those things is to be able to perpetuate that wisdom and hand it down to my kids 
uh, to younger men who uh, who either seek me out for advice or circumstantially I have the opportunity to share something that that could be beneficial uh, in their in their season in their life. But I mean, like you said, when you have kids, it changes everything. When you have teenagers, it changes everything yet again. And now my kids, uh, so we got we have four daughters, and so uh, and so now with three of them in college and one about to head off that way, you begin to have more adult conversations, and it's so weird to all of a sudden be talking to your child and they're not a child anymore. It just hits you, and you go, "Whoa, wait a minute! We're not supposed to be talking about taxes." Yeah, you know, we're not supposed to be talking about you know, credit scores and this kind of, you know, yeah. it's just been cool. But one of the things that I commit to is being intentional. Uh, and so um, it all kind of started with the, when they graduate from high school, I write them a little kind of a manifesto kind of thing. Like, like these are the things that I wish I would have known at your age. That's great. I you like know, that. Use them wisely. And <clears throat> yeah. so each one is different even though there are a lot of similarities, right? A lot of the same things still apply, but there's some individualism to each of those letters. And, uh, you anyway, know, I have them all. And that's, uh, that's uh, awesome. I, I remember very specifically when I went to college, I, and you know, I know where I was, I know the street I was on, I was walking and I just had this thing and I was like, man, I wish somebody wrote me a book on like how to do this or how to <laughs> like do whatever. Heck um, yeah. I heard, a sentence. I, Give me something. I heard a, uh, I heard a few things this morning. One, hey, man, I, I wanted to talk to you about this. I don't know how you are on time, but um, it, it, the, it, it's a self-insurance deal, but that's the insurance side. But the, the one that applies specifically to this was capsule. Like this guy's coming out with a new, like social media type thing where you can record pre-record for your son, daughter, whoever it is, friend, family member, whatever, and have it go out on a, on a, on a date. So it's like, Hey, I remember the first time I was going to college, the first day was like this and it was so scary and this is what was going on. And then it just drops into them. And so I was like, Oh, that's, that's interesting. I like what you're yeah. doing. We do, I do, I say we, I, I do a, a thing now where I have a journal for all of my kids, for both the kids and for my wife. And it's like, at, when I'm writing in it, it's like, Hey, you know, you just lost your first tooth. This is what happened. Oh well, man, this is how you were feeling. So those things I, I like, and I like reading back, but I haven't thought of doing what you did. Um, but it's which, a great. I mean, what you what you're doing is fantastic, and in a way, you're writing your own scripture. Yeah. Because I mean, think about the Bible's been around for two thousand years, you know, or whatever the stories have been, and 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 yet the the information, the the knowledge, and the guidance, and the wisdom in there is timeless. And so, you know, just like what you're talking about with this capsule idea, it's it's the we all have the fear, especially us men, but we have the fear of not of dying and not being remembered. It's just this thing that we want. We don't necessarily we get to a point in time, you know, you know, in our lives where we don't care anymore about being recognized or I, I don't need all that anymore. Right. I want to live my life peacefully and happily and abundantly. And the rest is just noise. But we have to operate in this real world scenario and not in a system of, or, or, you know, the rose colored ideal glasses on. And, and so by doing things like what you're doing, you're in a way writing your own scripture, you know, not in, not in the same manner as a Bible. Okay. Yeah. But it is scripture. It's, it's something that you can pass on to your kids that they will have in their possession and can refer back to 100%. as parents, the hardest thing that we can do is just do it, is just make it. Because, I mean, you think about it. When I was growing up, we didn't have cell phones or any of that crap, much less. I mean, you know, we still had the dang roto dial and I know. or the or the one that hung on the wall, you know, know, with a 12 yeah. foot extent, you know, curly cable that so you could go around the corner and Puddle up, you know, we're and and you yeah. know, but kids are, are are being bombarded with so much <clears throat> madness these days, and they don't have the tools to cope with it. 
it's premature exposure to to how many things, right? And so um, so so having that ability to document things along the way gives you perspective as things come up as they arise, you know, throughout your children's lives. You can, I think, you'll be better prepared to respond rather than react. Oh yeah. I, and it's but, but always in yeah always anticipate and I, one of the biggest things that I recommend to you know parents is stay in their business they won't like it one bit but stay I don't in, think, all up in their business I don't think we have know? any problem with that my wife is all about being up in the business I'm like yep. leave it leave it that's enough <laughs> she's like no. yes so, yes uh, so. Well, Corey, Lots man, I appreciate fun. you yep. you sharing. I mean, we got some philosophical at the end. I like it. It's it's for me having these conversations and and like getting to know everybody that I'm talking to a bit better is always uh, beneficial and helpful. And I I I like that we got to that point. So uh, got to know you better. Did you know that 80% of the agents we speak with got into real estate in order to gain passive income so they could obtain financial freedom and become work optional? If you want to stay up to date. The best way is to make sure you're subscribed. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and do it now. We'll catch you on the next episode.